Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining NMSDC's COVID-19 virtual town hall. Momentarily, we will be joined by Adrian Trimble, President and CEO of NMSDC for today's session, the CARES Act, what's next and when. Thank you so much, Dawn, and good afternoon, everyone. Again, I'm Adrian Trimble, President and CEO of the National Minority Supplier Development Council. Want to thank all of you for joining us today. We do apologize that we started just a tad bit late today, but we wanted to make sure that we were being respectful of the time. We have some very special guests with us. There's a very important vote that is taking place with um, that will require the uh, participation of one of our special guests. So we want to make sure that we give her all the time to be with us today and that she is not late for her, her a very important vote. We'll make sure that that, that, that happens. Um, so thank you all for joining. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, this is our seventh virtual town hall series that we've put in place. We implemented these to make sure that we're bringing you the most up-to-date information regarding COVID-19 and how it impacts minority businesses. Last week's town hall focused on financial institutions and we were very fortunate to have Harvey Butler, who is the global head of supplier diversity for supplier diversity at Barclays, who moderated a wonderful session to help us understand what the financial institutions are doing to help support minority businesses. So there was great information there. If you missed the webcast, it is on our website at nmsdc.org. The panelists were very informative, very candid with their feedback. We want to take a moment to thank them. We want to make sure that we thank our National Director of the Minority Business Development Agency, Henry Childs II, who has been a, a wonderful partner with us through this whole time as we've been thinking of ways that we can reposition funding and access to funding for our minority businesses. We want to thank Patty Juarez, who is the National Diverse Segment Director of Commercial Banking at Wells Fargo. James Sills III, who is the President and CEO of Mechanics and Farmers Bank. Mercedes Enrique, who's the president and owner of CM Corporation, and Abel Herrera, who is the president and CEO of IT Data Solutions. So again, we thank all of you for joining us. We thank the panelists from last week, and we wanted to make sure that we brought forth another very interesting informative session today as we talk about what's gonna happen next with the CARES package. We know that there is, again, a historical vote that is taking place, and we want to make sure that we have advocacy for minority businesses as a part of it. We've learned that from a number of our MBEs from a survey that we took this week, that many of them still have not even been able to get a response from their banks. So we understand that it's important to ensure that this round of funding definitely has an impact for our minority businesses. So I'm gonna go right into it first and introduce our guests, because again, she may have to dash out at, a, at any moment because she's being called to the floor for her vote, Congresswoman, Brenda Lawrence. She represents Michigan's 14th Congressional District that includes a portion of Detroit, the city of Southfield, and 16 other cities located in Oakland and Wayne counties. She lives in the 14th District and has been there her entire life, and she was first elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in November of 2014 and was re-elected in 2016 and in 2018. Congresswoman Lawrence serves as a co-chair of the Bipartisan Congressional Caucus for Women's Issues, the Democratic Women's Caucus and second vice chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. She sits on the powerful House Appropriations Committee, serving on the Subcommittee on Transportation and Housing and Urban, De Urban Development. She's on the Subcommittee on Commerce, Justice, Science, and on the Government Operations and the Subcommittee on National Security. She is born and raised and she is from Detroit, everybody. Congresswoman Lawrence, thank you so very much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Madam President, for hosting this call and inviting me to attend. It's so great uh, to be with you. I'm Congresswoman again, Brenda Lawrence, and I represent the Michigan 14th District, which um, is one of the most diverse districts, not only in Michigan, but in Congress. As a member of the House Committee on Appropriations, it's my responsibility to ensure we are delivering that much needed assistance to help oversee the current economic and public health emergency that we are facing. Before I start my technical or my comments related to the uh, economy, it is very important that I want everyone listening to know that I see, I hear, uh, see and hear your pain, 
uh, those who have lost family, those who are struggling with the virus, those who are trying to figure their way through this economically. This has been a beast. And the African-American community has been hit the hardest. And I understand that. I, I hear you. And the, the burden that I personally have, I've, I flew on a plane today uh, with my mask and with my gloves on because I know how important it is that you have someone fighting for you. And I take that responsibility and I want everyone to know that this is serious and that we're going to stay and work through this together. And there'll be a time where I won't have to sit on a screen. I'll be able to see you personally. Now, in these unprecedented economic times, you must make sure that our own minority-owned businesses are not overlooked or left to fend for themselves during this global epidemic. Uh, organizations such as the National Minority Supplier Development Council play an incredibly important role in ensuring that our minority-owned organizations stay strong and sustainable. I fully understand the havoc that has been caused by this virus. Businesses large and small, the Paycheck Protection Program, which Congress authorized through the, um, the Virus Act Release and Economic Security Bill, which was CARES, provided small businesses with opportun options to keep staff on payroll and their businesses afloat until the worst of this pandemic passed. Unfortunately, we thought we were doing something with $300 billion. The program ran its allocation two weeks after it started due to the overwhelming demand. You know, this is like you are flying a plane and all of a sudden someone just suck all the gas out of your plane. You didn't plan for it you've been hit, that's the bell to call the vote, but I'm okay right now. And so I, I understand that, but though a couple things happen, you need to know. The SBA did not have a process. The banks did not have a process. And then you all were not prepared for how to apply for this. It was boom, 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 boom. So SBA was overwhelmed. They had to sit down and de delay things to figure out how to allocate it. The, um, you all were trying to figure out running around as the business own owners, what do we do? How do we get it? Then the banks were overloaded and still have multitudes of applications they have in process. And then you lap on top of that, the inherent bias that all of us has experienced with our financial institutions. And so I'm getting, I've just had a teletown hall with my Michigan Association of Bankers saying what the heck happened. I see what you're doing. You took those large um, bank relationships that you had, those businesses that have deposited millions of dollars into your bank, because I heard some small business owners who were literally trying to fill out an application where a phone call was made to those um, businesses that they have relationships with all the time. So um, I've heard from them about being frustrated with the applications. That's why I'm back here in, today in Washington to vote on expanding the success of the CARES Act and get more funding to your businesses. Now, I'm not gonna blow smoke up your skirt or your pants leg. There are um, thousands of applications that were approved that did not get awarded them funds because we ran out of money. So now we are allocating more money and today we'll pass legislation that will be 310 billion in additional funds 30 million, 30 billion, excuse me, 30 billion of this money is set aside for mid-sized banks and credit unions with assets between 10 million and 50 billion. So some of you um, may or may not know some of the lending institutions were not certified as being able to process SBA loans or federal dollars. They, 
I just spoke to a credit union that went through the process as this all was going on to get certified so that he could actually lend money. So if you have a relationship with a small bank, check in again. We haven't released the money yet. This is the time I expect everyone to be on the phone with their lender. Do you, are you able to process this loan? If you have not heard something back from a bank does not mean you were not qualified. You should call your lender if you made an application and you receive that SBA loan number, you should call your lender, your bank or financial institution and say, am I in the queue? That is something that is very important. Before we release the money, we're, we're voting on this today. The president will probably sign it either tonight or in the morning, and then the clock starts ticking. So I encourage you all to do that. Another 30 billion is set aside for banks and credit unions minority and community development financial institutes with less than 10 billion in assets. And that's one of those institutions I told you about. These community banks, small and mid-sized lenders are the backbones of the minority business community. And that's where we heard you didn't have a relationship with Wells Fargo or, or Comerica or PCF, because those are the big banks and a lot of times our minority um, business owners, they do business with the smaller and local community banks. So please check in with them. Um, the legislation that I vote, I'll be voting for secures $50 billion for SBA emergency disaster lending and $10 billion in SBA emergency disaster grants, a grant you don't have to pay back. Um, that is limited to $10,000. So if you haven't applied for that, please apply for that as well. Those are very easy to get as long as the money is there. The package is important because these funds can be used to make or break the difference between some of our smaller and most vulnerable. The bill also provides an inclusion of infusion of, class, of cash to, for testing. And that's a whole nother um, broadcast where the, this disease or virus has had a disproportionate attack on the African-American community. And that the only way we're gonna fight this in our community is testing, testing, testing. So we infused money, we fought for that, for testing. In closing, I recognize that this package is only a temporary fix. In addition to that, you know, there's unemployment benefits, there was a stimulus check. And um, I'm committed to keep fighting understand that we asked for another stimulus check it was turned down by the senate by the republicans um we know that this is lasting longer than we thought initially and this is just each step we just scratch and trying to make sure that we are taking care of our small businesses and the crime of what happened many of you are going to ask that question well how the heck did you run out of money when you have rue chris of all places who is traded on, on the stock market, has a, a tremendous amount of access to resources. How did they get this emergency money? It was based on that bank relationship. And I'm gonna close with this. If you do not have, some of you as minority business owners, you act as if you're a private citizen. You, you saved your money, you worked hard, you used your cash so you didn't have any debt. And then you deposit your money and pull it out. You did, sometimes some of you don't ever go inside the bank. It's those relationships are important that we start developing that so that we can, con if this ever happens again, that those relationships are built. I had a, a multi-million dollar manufacturing company, and he told me that his bank told him he was denied because he didn't initial a box. He, because he had banks with this company, had a relationship picked up the phone and called someone and raised a boatload of sand till he got to someone and said, you're going to fix this because, you know, I am your customer. So with that, I'm going to say thank you so much, and I'm going to stay on this call until they call me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Representative Lawrence, and we appreciate all that you are doing, being that voice for us, advocating for our minority businesses. Um, definitely appreciate it. Um, one thing I don't know if you heard as we were starting the call, but there are questions that are being 
posed through our, uh, from our attendees. So I will try to get some of those questions um, to you before you leave. But I wanted to kind of um, dig down a little bit into some of the information that you shared. Um, one thing that we are trying to really understand, um, because you're right, a number of minority businesses felt that they were just shut out. A lot of the big businesses got access to the funds that were supposed to help some of the smaller ones. How can we how can we be assured that in this process that our minority businesses will indeed get the attention and the access that they need? I know that they're giving the CDFIs and, and credit unions, um, hopefully the ability to fund, but Again, what should our minority businesses do to make sure that they get that access? I've been hearing a lot of things. So one of the things that bankers told me yesterday when I was on the phone call with them, that some of the minority or small businesses just didn't have their books together and that their CPA or the person who is responsible for keeping their books, the sophistication of being prepared, because this was so fast, being prepared so that they could literally take this opportunity and jump on it. And so some of you, you know, they're going to, two things they did wrong. They shut down the portable, portable as soon as they ran out of money. So one of the things they recommended is that they actually go and review the application, jump on, be on top of it so you can get it together. You know, a lot of things I could advise, but this is happening so fast that um, every recommendation may not be the best that's gonna help you right now. But again, those relationships with the bank, filling out those applications, uh, trying those little small banks, uh, that's why we infused money and empowered those community and smaller bankers that's right in the community. They did not make any direction for minority, but they did set aside 30 billion that will be only for small businesses. And that does not mean 500 employees more, that's five, 500 and less, and then some that were even smaller than that. So we, we did make a provision so the smaller businesses would have access, a pot of money just set aside for them. Thank you. And that hopefully that will definitely provide the type of access that our businesses need. Um, mm -hmm. Another question that we have is understanding that there are a couple of lawsuits that have been filed toward targeting some of the large banks for their processes and not mm -hmm. giving small businesses those opportunities first. What types of provisions have been put in place for accountability for those financial institutions to ensure that they're not just um, that they're not sifting through the applications, picking, quote, winners versus losers, but really looking at this as a, on a first-come, first-served basis. Are there any accountability methods or mechanisms put in the bill? So, unfortunately, this experience has taught us a lot. One of the things I learned, I said, because the bank said, we didn't do any preferential treatment. We didn't do anything to push back someone and give someone else preference. So I said, how do you know how many loans were actually given? I asked that to the SBA and I asked that of the banking. Were given to minority-owned businesses. There's nothing on the application to define whether the lender is a minority-owned business. There is some criteria that will identify if you're small-owned, um, you know, small business, but there's nothing. So that's something that we're going to be pushing now that when there are loans given out that we can actually identify what percentage of the loans actually went to minority owned businesses because there's not. So, you know, the immediate response from a banker was, are you saying that we're supposed to give preference to minority owned businesses? I said, no, sir, I want you to be held accountable to what's the percentage that you gave. Nobody's telling you what to do, but I would find it hard to believe in this process, when we have so many minority-owned businesses, that there isn't a proportion of the loan or the money being given to minority. So that's something we're going to have to do. We're going to have to start tracking it. Excellent. And actually, one of the things that NMSDC is looking to do is to partner with SBA so that we understand the financial institutions may have some restrictions around asking for that ethnic or racial information. We at NMSDC don't have those restrictions. So yes. we are going to be working with our constituents and our MBEs to ask the questions 
just as we did this week. We surveyed them and we found that over 50% have submitted loan applications and still have not received any response back from their banks. Only 12% have been funded so far. So we're gonna to continue to gather those analytics share those with SBA so that hopefully as we continue to progress, we can correct some of these challenges that our, our community is seeing. Um, and please, if I can just interject, if you didn't get an answer, if you didn't get a rejection, please call your bank, especially if the SBA gave you that number, uh, the loan approval number, please call the bank and see if you're in the queue. Excellent. So we know that there's still some question around the definition of what a small business is. It really depends on in terms of how it's being viewed. Mm -hmm. Are public companies going to be allowed to, to continue to receive PPP loans through the new funding or how will that work for versus public companies versus small privately owned minority or small businesses? That's an excellent question because what happened is that it was the size of the company, not private. So so give you an example, Ruth Chris did not fit any of those criteria, but their company is divided up into segments. So they took a portion of it here to ask for money and then the other portion of their company to ask for it under that. And if they divided the company up, it would fit into those small pockets. So we thought we had covered that, check that box, but Again, the more sophisticated the uh, HR department and financial resources that a multi-million dollar company has, the way they look at it for loopholes. So we, we are now looking at, looking at the comprehensive makeup of a company versus, to give you an example, if I'm a builder and I have one company that does landscaping and it's, it's the green company, under my umbrella. Then I have another company that does drywall and it's the wall company. So what they did, they took the green company and applied, then they took the wall company and applied. And so it depends on how your company is distributed with your structure. So, I mean, most small businesses don't have that problem. Uh, it's, it's a small business and everything is under one umbrella. Excellent, thank you for that clarification. So we'll definitely be keeping our eye on that. Mm -hmm. um, we're also trying to understand, as this legislation was being crafted, were there advocacy groups around the table to help give input, insight? I, I, we heard uh, President Trump last night giving some uh, updates in terms of how he's pulling together uh, groups that can help inform some of these decisions that represent, I think the word that he used was either uh, distressed communities or um, I can't think of the actual term, but he indicated that there would be some kind of um, advocacy groups that he would be looking to inform these decisions, I think headed by Ben Carson. Can you give any light on what that process is or what that is intended to do? I, I'm, I'm gonna really try to shape this, this answer. So if I say I want to assemble a group of people to advise me, but the criteria to be part of my advisor is that you have to think just like me, that you have to agree with everything I say. There's not a lot of opportunity for inclusiveness because it is of one agenda. And unfortunately, I've seen that played out more times than not. Um, I will give you an example. Uh, Secretary Carson, um, eliminated a homeless program as the director of housing. Um, and when I questioned him about it, he said, oh no, I believe in protecting the housing department, but you recommended, sir, I sit on appropriations, you recommended your department to eliminate that. He said, well, we have to count on our nonprofits to take care of that. Where well, I feel strongly that the federal government if we don't start looking at housing opportunities for our homeless, where if you go to LA, I don't know how many people have been to LA and see that, that awful display of homelessness is in Washington, it's in Chicago, it's here in DC. We don't see it as much as it's, it's in Detroit, but my goodness in these cities. And then when you look at this, the food lines, which is devastating, to watch that people are trying to get food to feed their families. 
So I, I don't have a lot of faith in that. But your question is, how can we get people to the table? Um, one of the challenges we had is that this was an emergency. And so everyone was moving, of so many moving parts, and we're trying to fix a plane while still flying in air. And so we understand that we need to put some things in place to ensure that the voices of all people are heard. Just like me talking to my bank bankers yesterday, I would have loved to have had three months to sit with my bankers and then communicate with my minority business community and connect those dots. Um, but I wasn't given that opportunity to move so fast. But believe me, I, I have learned a lot as well. And uh, we are going to put some things in place so that if this ever happens again, I pray to God it doesn't, we'll be better prepared. Let's, let's be prayerful that you're right, that this doesn't happen again. But yes. I always say you have to plan for the best. Well, you know, plan for the worst and hope for the best. So let's, yes. let's think about how we can do that. Um, as we look at this next round of appropriations for the, for the stimulus package, I know the first round did include nonprofits. Um, yes. What about the, ch the, the, the churches and the, the faith-based communities? Are they also included? Is that money that's set aside inclusive of those organizations as well? In the new round? So, so this is a challenge. Our, our federal policies and laws do not allow us to support religious institution or religious bodies. However, a lot of churches, thank goodness during this crisis, had formed nonprofits within the church. To give you an example, if you are doing a community um, uh, drug rehabilitation program in your church is faith-based and you run a program for drug re rehabilitation and you created a nonprofit, you can apply for stimulus money for that nonprofit. It could be a food bank. It could be a tutoring pro. It could be a returning citizen training program. So those religious organizations who have nonprofits, they're absolutely eligible to apply. Excellent. Great. One of the things we're trying to understand is that, and you mentioned this already, that when this bill is signed by the president, um, that the floodgates are going to open. Do yes. we know specifically when the SBA will open up the portal and for, and, and for idle loans, when that bill is, is um, passed? Do you, is there a timing that we can communicate? Well, the last bill, it was supposed to open immediately, but they held, the, held back because they needed to write the processes and create structure for the program. Since we've gone through this before, we are anticipating, I'm being told by the SBA, that it will open up immediately because they've already done that. And they already have some of the um, applications in the queue. I am being told this is not good news, but I'm being told it'll probably be 48 hours before they run out of money again. 48 hours. Did everybody hear that? Mm -hmm. If you have an application to queue, get mm -hmm. busy. 48 yes. hours is not a lot of time. You're absolutely right. Thank you for that. And my final question for you before I introduce the next guest, um, um, as I've been looking at the, the questions coming through the chat, is what can we do as either NMSDC, our affiliate councils, you have a very strong council that's there in Michigan, um, we have some very strong business owners, as you may, may or may not know from my background, I come from Toyota, so I'm very much related to the automotive industry. But what can we do to help you and help others um, give insight and, and help form opinions around the, if there should be a next round of legislation or things that we should be doing to help prepare minority businesses? What would be some advice you'd give us? So I'm so grateful you opened that up because we are currently now working on the next phase, which will include funding to municipalities, funding for the Postal Service, funding for um, a stimulus, if we're gonna do that again, how do we attack this disparity in the, um, in the attack of this virus? And there's so many things we need to look at. It may be another uh, extension of the funding, although I'm being told there's not a lot of energy to do another package of um, loans. However, it is in, it's really important that the organization 
minor, minority businesses under your leadership that you put together a paper saying that these are the things that were um, a challenge for us if you had did this differently. And it's, it's good because if you do that, I promise you the Congressional Black Caucus will be presenting this to leadership. And we have five chairs of committee. We have the uh, third person in power, Clyburn. And so our voice is being heard. And it's just like we put money in for testing, for mobile testing that, you know, no one could figure out why. Well, if we disproportionately dying from this virus, we need to test. And if you just sit there and look at these zip codes and say, well, we'll park a van somewhere and everybody come to it, it's not happening. So we're gonna be going into the neighborhoods and doing the tracking and doing everything we need to do to stop the virus and hopefully stop the impact on our community. Um, but you, I need you to provide us, this didn't work, this did work, keep this, whatever you do, don't take this away. This didn't work, you need to change that. And these are some of the recommendations. If you provide that to, to us, I promise you, uh, as, a, as a, one of the executive members of the Congressional Black Caucus and as a member of Congress and as a Black woman in America, little Black girl from the east side of Detroit, that I will get this to the table and we will, we will work to implement some changes. Thank you very much. We, I know that, as you know, NMSTC has 23 affiliate councils. Most of those yes. presidents are on this call. I hear a call to action that you're giving us. Yes. NMSTC has some of the, the largest, most sophisticated minority business owners in the country. Actually, I would say in the world. And we would definitely take you up on that in terms of how we can put together what those challenges have been and work with you and the constituents, uh, your constituencies to understand how do we fix it for the future. So thank, thank you so you. much. Everyone be safe and thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us and we're ready, ready for your vote. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you. Thank you. Our next guest has joined us. Uh, Senator um, Chris Van Hollen is on the line with us. Senator, are you there? I'm here. How are Great. you? Great. Thank you so well, much for joining us. Uh, let me just give a brief introduction on Senator Van Hollen. Um, Senator Van Hollen believes that every child deserves the opportunity to pursue their dreams and benefit from a quality education and that anyone willing to work hard should be able to find a good job. That's why his top priority includes creating more and better jobs, strengthening small businesses, and increasing educational and job training opportunities for individuals of all ages, all ages in every community. Senator Van Hollen started his, part, his, his time in public service as a member of the Maryland State Legislature, where he quickly became known as a tenacious advocate for everyday Marylanders and someone who was unafraid to take on powerful interests on behalf of working, the working people. He was elected to Maryland's 8th Congressional District in 2002, and in the House of Representatives, he served as a member of the Democratic leadership and was elected by his colleagues to be the ranking member on the House Budget Committee and protect vital interests such as Social Security and Medicare. So thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to, to join us. We appreciate it and, and would like to just have you introduce yourself in, to the constituents on the phone. Well, thank you very much uh, to you, uh, President Trimble, and thank you and NMSDC for all the work you're doing. And I'm uh, trying, like all of us, to bring myself into this age of new technology so I can actually see you on Zoom right now. I, I tried to get in through the video as well, but I don't think you can see me. Uh, but you can hear me, right? We can hear you. We can't see, but we can't hear right. you. All uh, right. I can see you, um, but uh, let, me, let me just again thank you. And uh, I do also wanna give a, a shout out uh, to uh, Sharon Pinder, who I've worked with for, for many years, uh, who's the, currently the, the Capital Region MSDC um, leader. So thank, thank you to all of you around the country. Uh, these are very difficult times because of the virus, which is having uh, a disproportionate harmful impact on communities of color and especially the African-American community. I was just listening to my uh, former House colleague, um, Congresswoman Lawrence, and just wanna 
second the comments that she made when it comes to testing. Uh, it's really important that we uh, test not only people who are symptomatic, but that we have a sense of the virus if it starts to, if we try to reopen and tries to reemerge, it starts to reignite within communities, especially minority, minority communities. We need an early warning system uh, there, and that's why it's so important to have a comprehensive rapid testing uh, program. Um, let me just briefly mention some of the issues you've covered and then happy to try to answer any uh, questions. Uh, the reason I was on the Senate floor about 10 days ago blocking uh, Mitch McConnell, the Republican leader's effort to bring up the PPP legislation and just replenish the fund without any reforms was because uh, of what uh, everyone on this call knows and what I've been hearing when I was in communication with our small businesses, especially minority owned businesses, which is the, the monies were not flowing through the system to uh, small businesses as needed it the most. And so that's why we insisted uh, that if we're going to replenish the fund, uh, we have to create some mechanisms that will better channel those monies. Uh, to where they're needed most. And that's why this most recent bill passed by the Senate, which I think the House is probably voting on now, um, includes the $60 billion uh, set aside to go to community lenders. And within that, uh, the $30 billion specifically targeted toward uh, minority depository institutions, CDFIs, and micro lenders. Uh, th that may not be, you know, I, I would like to have seen some other proposals that actually make sure that the monies are going to very small businesses, uh, but um, it, at least this latest version will direct those these monies, at least $60 billion, through more community lenders. Um, I was on the phone this morning uh, with a lot of our uh, business leaders in Baltimore City, uh, African-American business leaders, and we all need to be working together in this next phase to make sure that those funds are getting to where they're needed most. That requires transparency and accountability. Um, I, I was actually on the phone this morning with uh, Secretary Mnuchin. I've been trying to get through to him for a couple of days, but one of the points I stressed was that we need to know where this money's going to hold people accountable. Um, so we'll have to continue to do that in Congress. Uh, we also, as you know, uh, increased the funds for the emergency disaster loan program, uh, which was not part of McConnell's plan 10 days ago. He didn't have any additional monies for that program, which has been an important lifeline to some uh, small businesses. So those are some of the changes that we're making. Um, I think many of us predicted that these funds for both programs would uh, run out very quickly. Um, I heard the comment uh, that Congresswoman Lawrence made about the next round being exhausted in, in a short period of time. Um, I, I just want to, in, in closing my opening comments, just say we're working with people in Maryland, small businesses in Maryland, to try to make sure on this round um, we maximize the amount of money that can go where it's supposed to go, which is to small businesses that are really in most of need, most need. So. Let me let me end there. Happy to try and answer any questions, and uh, thank you for all your good work um, um, during this pandemic, and for all the work that you're doing before, and will do when we get out of this together. Thank you so much, um, and appreciate and really appreciate your your comments there. Um, in case you didn't um, hear at, as, as since you joined the call, oh, we can see you now. Wonderful. Can you see me now? <laughs> we can see you okay. now. All right. Good. <laughs> We are receiving. I'm hearing questions. you on my phone. Okay. <laughs> All right. We are actually receiving questions from the attendees on the webcast as well. So we'll try to get to some of those. But um, I want to go back to a point that you made. Um, I'm really glad to hear you talk about focusing on reform prior to the next round of funding being made available. Um, one of the things we haven't heard a lot about is the disaster recovery loans that are out there. Um, we've heard of quite a bit about PPP, but can you talk about what the, the idle loans are, how they're intended, and what we can ex anticipate in the next round of funding? Yes. So in the, in the bill that's uh, going to pass the House of Representatives uh, this afternoon, uh, we 
replenished what are called the idle funds, emergency, injury, disaster um, funds. And this is now going to be a $50 billion fund for the loans, the idle loans, and $10 billion in that fund for the grants. So the way this works um, is this program is administered through this Small Business Administration. Uh, the PPP program, as you know, uh, is uh, a channel through lenders in the 7A program. And we've tried to dramatically expand in a very short period of time the, numbers of the number of lenders who can participate in 7A so that we can get more of the money uh, where it's needed most. Uh, the EIDL program is administered by the Small Business Administration, and it has a grant component and a loan component. component. The grant component is up to is $10,000, and that is a, a pure grant. There, there are no uh, requirements that have to be demonstrated in order for it to be forgiven. Uh, you know, like the PPP loan, in order to get forgiveness at the end of the day, you have to demonstrate a number of things. With the EIDL grant, the $10,000 grant, you have to make certifications about uh, the fact that it's needed because of the situation uh, that's being faced right now. But then there's also a loan uh, component. Um, it, it, the, the loan component is up to $2 million. Uh, although as the monies in that fund began to shrink, uh, you know, just before it was replenished, the maximum loan they were providing was $15,000, not the $2 million. But, but with the replenishment of the fund, there'll be the $10,000 grant and a $2 million loan, so, much, so long as the funds are there. Um, and the interest payment on those loans is it's, it's, it's pretty low. I don't, I don't, it's around 2%, I believe. And it's repayable over a long period of time. I think it can be repaid over a 30 year period. So they're, they're, um, they're very good loan terms under that program. Now, you can, you can do both. You can apply for an idle grant and loan. And then you can also apply for a PPP. If you, if you get the grants under the EIDL program, and then you go into the PPP program, essentially that $10,000 would be deducted uh, from the amount that you would get under PPP. So under PPP, you get two and a half times payroll. So if you've already got an EIDL grant for $10,000, you, you would get that much less uh, from the uh, monies in the PPP program, but but you can pursue both uh, at the same time. Excellent, excellent. And I think that's a really great distinction. I think folks need to understand that the difference between the portion that is the actual grant versus that this part of the, this this targeted as a loan. And you're right, the terms are very favorable over a long period of time. One question I have is: Does it go through the traditional? loan process such as underwriting and things of that nature that the portion is for the loan is there any special uh, considerations for for the for the for that piece of it for the idle program which is, is as we just said goes through just the SBA window so it doesn't go through banks or other lenders um, they are under under the rules for this particular time period uh, they're supposed to essentially take self certification with respect to the need um, going forward. So uh, there should not be a lot of sort of underwriting requirements uh, for this. Um, we will, we're, we're trying to keep ourselves updated on all the, uh, you know, frequently asked questions. Um, but to my knowledge, uh, there, uh, you know, they, they, there's not, a, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a long and complicated process. Got it. And Senator, I got a note from our uh, technical team asking, can you tilt your screen down just a tad bit so that we can get more of your face in there? There you go. Okay. okay. Nope. Back the other way a little bit. Back up. Back. A little bit more. The other way. Right. Up. Good. That's probably, that's better. Oh. There you go. Right in there. Perfect. That okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the things we have a question from uh, uh, one of our audience members is what's the best way to find out the status of the idle loan application, specifically the loan, not the, not the um, grant portion of it, but how should individuals try to find out the status of the loans? So um, good question. We're trying to go through this process um, every day with the small business administration uh, because there is a huge 
backlog. It's been very difficult, I know, uh, for applicants to get through and get information. Um, it's been also hard for our office uh, to get through uh, with respect to any particular applications. I think that the best advice is to, um, again, keep trying uh, through the SBA contacts that you have for your uh, particular area. I would engage um, your representatives, your members of the House uh, and the Senate to try to help navigate uh, through this, this process. Um, and one of the questions that has come up is if you already had an application pending for an idle loan, uh, when the money ran out, does that mean you've got to reapply? And uh, you should not have to reapply. Uh, if you've got a, an application pending um, and in line at the Small Business Administration, you should not have to re reapply. But again, the, the best advice is to keep trying. I recognize, I recognize how frustrating it is uh, because I'm in touch every day with uh, our small businesses and uh, we are also trying to break through. As you can imagine, there's just a huge volume of uh, applications. And our goal in this most recent round, um, as I talked about the redesign of the PPP program, is to, is to try to make sure more of those funds do flow uh, to uh, where, where they're needed most and through you know, minority depository institutions and CDFIs. One of the questions that I asked Representative Lawrence that I would like to ask you as well is really around the accountability. So what type of accountability mechanisms were put in place for financial institutions to ensure that they are indeed following the process of first come first served versus kind of sifting through the application applications that they have and which subsequently impacts our ability for our minority businesses to get that uh, get access to that funding. Are there any accountability measures that were placed this go around for those financial institutions, the larger ones? So um, a, a group of senators, Democratic senators, uh, just wrote to both uh, Secretary Mnuchin and the SBA administrator uh, saying that it's really important that they collect the data so that we can make the kind of determinations uh, you just raised. You know, we spent a lot of time uh, trying to nail down accountability measures uh, when it came to some of the monies that were flowing to big corporations because we were very worried about abuse uh, with those monies. Um, we should have more accountability provisions written in uh, to the PPP program. Um, we've been told that we're gonna have to hold their feet to the fire, uh, that they will provide us the data uh, with respect to uh, how the PPP monies are, are being spent. Um, as, as was indicated, uh, a lot of the early, you know, monies, um, some of the bigger banks established these requirements that were not part of the bill, um, but uh, they just, they, you know, you had to have a prior lending relationship with them and other criteria that they used uh, to deny a number, a number of the initial loans. Um, so we, may, we have made changes uh, to the Know Your Customer provisions and others uh, to try to prevent that from happening, um, along with our efforts to, do, to channel more of the money uh, to, uh, through community lenders. But I, all of us are going to have to be on full alert uh, as to where the monies are going. Now, we, you know, we just saw the other day that one of the major chains um, ended up, you know, publicly traded company got a bunch of the, the money, and now they're giving it back. So we found out about that uh, through some of the accountability reporting provisions. So um, this is, we're gonna have to help crowdsource uh, mm -hmm. this uh, effort. Please, please, you know, th this, is, this is obviously an important part, the transparency piece, important part of making sure that monies go where we all want them to go. To, be, to, to small businesses that really need them that are struggling that are often not part of the normal um, system. Great, thank you for that. Um, I have a couple of questions here from some participants that are similar, and it's around the idle grant was 10,000, and now it appears it's now 1,000 per employee. Can you talk about why that was changed or if that is indeed true that it did change 
And will there be any reconsideration of it with the new funding? So, yeah, that was one of the changes that were made. And I believe they made that as they were running out of money. So now okay. that the fund has been replenished, that should no longer be the case. As I uh, mentioned earlier, they also changed the maximum loan amount under the IELTS program from $2 million to $15,000 when they started running out of money. Um, and that's also when they started changing the grant from 10,000 to uh, 1,000 per employee. My, there's, let me put it this way. There's nothing in the legislation uh, that changes that. And so uh, now that the money's been replenished, uh, it, should be, it should revert back to what the original program is. Um, if I learn otherwise, I'll, I'll call you up and let you know. I will all probably be finding out about the same time. <laughs> but my understanding is now it goes back to the original terms, $10,000 grant up to a $2 million one. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Um, one of the questions here is that, um, and I'm not sure if this was, if you have the details of this, but I'll ask you, and if not, then we'll just try to get the information for this person. But there's um, data out there that says that SBA is now using EBITDA divided by interest, expense, and requiring six times interest to qualify for a loan. Is that actually true for either IDLE or PPP loans? Do you know if that's part of the criteria? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I just didn't hear you. So it's state, the question states that SBA is using EBITDA, EBITDA data divided by interest expense and requiring a six times interest to qualify for a loan. Is that actually true or is that, does it apply to IDLE or PPP loans? Uh, I don't, I, that's the first I've heard of that. Um, so I'm going to have to look okay. into that and get back to you. I do know one of my members of my staff team is also on this phone call. So we will try and track down um, that information and get back to you. And then maybe you can um, disseminate it to your members. Excellent. Um, but I, I, I hope not. Now, look, um, you know, one of the one of the things that's concerned me from the beginning with the design of this is that um, you, you know, there, there's an incentive here for um, banks and any lender uh, to provide the largest, you know, to prioritize the largest loan requests because they get they get one percent. Mm -hmm. So obviously, one percent of a larger number is more more funds. Um, again, that's one of the reasons we we reconfigured the design to try to make sure that more of the funds would go to community banks. Now that that incentive is still there for a community banker or, or you know, uh, a minority financial institution, but by taking such a big chunk of the money um, away from the big banks, uh, we thought that uh, that would that would certainly increase the chances of the money getting where it's needed most. Excellent. Well, thank you for that, and we really appreciate um, again just taking the holding have the more accountability put in place, focusing on the reform piece ensuring that it's um, meeting the intended audience that it's supposed to, because I think that's been part of the frustration that we've heard from our members. Um, we, did, we did survey our minority business uh, enterprise group, and what we found is that over 50% have submitted loan applications and they're just still waiting for a response. They've not gotten any response back from a, from a, from a banking institution. So I think it's really important for us to have those funds designated with some of the CDFIs, the credit unions, the small community banks that can ensure that those in the community can actually access those funds. Um, while we're getting ready to wrap up, uh, Senator, one question I would like to ask you is, I know that you, you, you're probably collecting information and data from small businesses. What are you hearing from your minority business constituents um, in terms of things that they would like to see or things that have been addressed in this next round of funding? So you're right, I've been in regular communication with um, our small businesses, especially our minority owned businesses. As I said I was on the phone this morning with uh, many of our uh, African American owned businesses in Baltimore City, uh, some of whom had been able to uh, access PPP uh, in round one and some who had not. Uh, so I think uh, overall, uh, I think everybody was 
happy with the changes we made in the program um, in terms of channeling more of the monies uh, to community lenders. That was one of the early requests. Uh, there's a lesson here, you know, Mitch McConnell beat us all up 10 days ago uh, when we blocked his effort to, you know, refund PPP without these changes. So we were, we were successful at holding out and getting at least some of the reforms uh, that we wanted. But I, I think the, you know, most of what I'm hearing is, uh, again, the, the need for more of this money to go uh, through community-based uh, lenders. And so that is the case also in Maryland anyway. Um, the, the information that I'm getting back is that the community lenders have been much more responsive um, in terms of their ability to process these loans. Uh, so we, we are actually, you know, for people who are who are trying to access some of these programs through the, some of the bigger banks initially, we have encouraged them to, you know, go to a, a community bank and, you know, I've been on the phone also with lenders in the state of Maryland trying to push them really hard uh, to uh, establish, uh, provide PPP loans to, to um, borrowers who have no prior relationship with that bank. Um, you know, because that is the, the purpose of this was to try to make sure that more lenders who are not part of the normal 7A program did take on uh, these loans. So that is our, our, our major major uh, challenge. And then the other the other uh, major concern relates to uh, the issues uh, around the, dis the disparate impact the coronavirus is having uh, on communities of color in the African American community. And uh, we in Maryland, uh, you know, I, a group of us pushed very strongly nationally to get the CDC to release. Uh, the data um, in terms of the racial impact, the ethnic impact, uh, they're beginning to do that. We moved in Maryland, so we asked our governor uh, to release the information by zip code. Uh, I'm pleased that he did do that. And that's not only important to learn more about the disease, but it's obviously important to help uh, us channel the resources uh, to where they're needed most, um, because we need to make sure that the resources, when it comes to the healthcare uh, battle, also go uh, to the areas of most need. Just like we need to make sure the economic um, resources, the PPP program, and idle loans go where they're, they're needed most. Uh, a lot of the confusion, a lot of the complication has come with respect to, uh, you know, sole proprietorship. Um, and, you know, self-employed um, uh, individuals who do qualify for PPP, but, obviously, but it's, it's much harder for them to break through the system. Uh, and so we're trying, to, we're trying to work with the smallest of the um, small businesses to try to access this relief. Really appreciate your, your comments. Definitely appreciate your work and your advocacy um, for minority businesses, small businesses. We really appreciate it. Um, as you leave us today, because I know that your time is limited and we appreciate the time that you did take, what advice would you give our minority businesses knowing that once this bill is signed into law, the window is going to be very short for them, for those who already have applications in the queue and have been waiting for a response. What advice would you give them to ensure that they are not left behind in this next round of funding? So this, this is a case where I would say both Persistence and reinforcements um, are going to be necessary, and I think uh, you know this is a situation where it may require a lot of phone calls and emails. Um, but uh, just because of the flood of applications now, as you said, they're supposed to be processed in terms of a first apply, uh, first serve basis, um, and that's why the transparency piece will be important. But for right now. Um, I think persistence and again, enlisting um, the help of your congressional delegations um, simply to keep an eye on, let, to let the, let the bankers know that we're all paying attention. Um, it doesn't mean that someone's you know, loan is gonna be processed ahead of somebody else as, and it shouldn't be that way, but we wanna make sure that the system is working for everybody because we know in round one, it did not. And so this is why, um, again, uh, 
persistence, but call in reinforcements. I, I would encourage uh, everybody listening here uh, to be in communication with members of Congress, the House and the Senate, uh, because in Maryland, I can tell you, we are very focused on pushing our lenders uh, to make sure the funds uh, get to where uh, they're really needed. Thank you so very much, and we appreciate your efforts, Senator. Thank you for taking your time with us today. Thank you. We'll All get right. through this together. Yes, we will. Yes, we will. Okay, audience, our next guest is with us. Um, he's no, no stranger to us. He's been on these calls before. We have Chris Pilkerton, who's the White House Policy Advisor of the Opportunity Now Initiative. Um, Chris, are you there? How are you? Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we know that you are probably extremely busy these days. Um, for those who may not be aware, uh, Chris Pilkerton serves as a White House Policy Advisor and former Acting Administrator of the U.S. Small Business Administration. He is also the current Executive Director of the White House Opportunity Now Initiative, which is a government-wide program that supports economic empowerment for underserved communities. Um, Chris, uh, thank you again for taking the time to be with us today. Our audience has a lot of very technical questions, so um, I've saved quite a bit of them for you, but I know we don't have that much time, but uh, I wanted to make sure that um, we have the opportunity to welcome you once again. Thank you for your time. And perhaps you could just open up by talking about what should we expect with this next round of funding and what's been fixed from the first uh, first uh, release of the of the funds and what our minority businesses should do to get ready. Sure, um, Adrian, thank you. And thank you once again for allowing me to participate in this event. I know just from feedback that I've received um, that your folks have gotten some good information and it's a great feedback loop for us as well to take back to make sure that the things that we're doing are working and if they're not um, trying to, to change them and, and refocus as necessary. Um, so as I have in the past, and I know uh, the Senator spoke uh, a lot about process um, and I do want to stress the last comment he made that we are all going to get through this together um, because I, I feel that way incredibly strongly. I haven't had the chance to witness the work of the folks working on this firsthand. Um, I do want to just kind of once again very quickly go through the process um, on the PPP and the disaster side. I know we're pressed for time, so I'll do it at a high level and really just kind of make the most germane points. Um, and then just kind of dive into a couple of other things and, and leave as much time for questions as we can. Um, but once again, the, the PPP, as folks know, the key there is to ensure that you're working directly with your lender. Um, I will stress that given the feedback loop that I referenced before, there are consistent frequently asked questions that are being updated in real time. Um, you can find that information at sba.gov, as well as information um, on the Treasury website. And there's also another website, coronavirus.gov backslash small business. I've highlighted those before, but those are great resources to get the most up-to-date information. And a lot of questions that folks may have will be in the FAQs, and you know, you'll recognize a, a lot of those. Um, I won't go into the great detail of the actual process. Um, I, I think the Senator did, although I wasn't able to listen to his entire presentation. Um, the process will be the same uh, or very similar with respect to going through your financial institution. Um, the next thing I did want to mention is the disaster loans, which I know the Senator mentioned. Those can be applied directly online at the SBA, so sba.gov backslash disaster. Um, so as soon as the funding is available, those two will be available. Uh, a really good point was made that both can be applied for, both the PPP and a disaster loan. Obviously, the difference is the PPP is a forgivable loan if used appropriately for 75% payroll and the rest for eligible expenses. Um, and then the disaster loan is a a long-term loan or a long tail loan up to 30 years with a low interest rate. So the difference is you do have to actually pay that back. However, um, businesses can use them both. They just can't use them both for the same thing. Um, so I think that's an important point to make for folks. Um, there's also the opportunity to speak to your lender about uh, an express bridge loan, 
which is essentially a bridge loan that can ultimately be, be taken out by disaster dollars if your lender participates in that, and that's up to $25,000. Um, the other thing I will mention as well is the technical assistance. Obviously, it's a very unique time, so you know, financial capital is incredibly important, but a lot of uh, businesses definitely need support, and this is a unique situation for everybody as they kind of rethink what their customer flow may look like, given everything that's happening. Um, so the SBA district offices are available to provide support as are the small business development centers and women's business centers. You can find out more information about that at sba.gov or www.americasbdc.org. Um, they can help you with all kinds of, of different things as we're all going through this process. The other thing I will mention as well is the SBA district offices, uh, there's 68 of them across the country and they are able to engage with you on a whole host of matters. So questions about the process, what have you. Other great things about the district offices is they're really well connected to the states and the cities. So if there's other questions that are coming up about your community, if there's other grants available, um, local unemployment issues, things like that, they can get you to the right person. So certainly want to make sure that folks are, are taking advantage of that resource now. Um, obviously, as the Senator mentioned, there is uh, specific funding here that focuses on CDFIs and community banks. Um, which is something that that's fantastic. And the work that I'm doing as the executive director of Opportunity Now is something that focuses particularly on underserved populations. The president mentioned yesterday that the uh, White House Revitalization and Opportunity Council is going to be working on these issues as well. So it's certainly top of mind for the administration, as well as all the things that uh, are being rolled out in this bill. So I can look forward to the opportunity to continue talking with you and your folks and getting that feedback loop as well. So this conversation will include everything that we can do together going forward. Excellent. Thank you so much, Chris. And I, and I know that is a lot of information and, and we truly appreciate you trying to break this down for um, our members so that they can um, figure out the best way to kind of navigate through this. A lot of the uh, guidelines are still unclear. So as, as some of these questions are coming in, I can see, I think it's very helpful. We will definitely continue to post um, the link that you send us to make sure that our members have access to the most updated information. So I do have a Great. couple here that I wanted to just, just bring your way, um, trying to get through some of the mechanics of this again, because some of the guidelines are unclear. Can you share with our members that if they have already applied for, um, if they've already received funds for an idle loan, can they still continue to apply for the PPP loan? Is what's, what's the difference between those two processes, or how do they connect? And is what sure. they get, um, get the other? Yeah, so they're for the purposes of this, they're separate. Um, so as you know, in the PPP loan, that's the loan where it really is focused on employees, um, seventy-five percent of it, and that impacts different businesses differently. So, for example, if you don't have any employees, um, then, you know, unless you're a, a sole proprietorship that's able to take a salary, then you're not really going to get much of the benefit from the PPP. But if you do need um, some financial support, the idle loan may be more appropriate for you um, if you were going to do one or the other. And as I mentioned, you can do both. Um, the reason you would probably do both is you've got a few employees. You want to make sure that they get paid and they stay connected to your company but you also have other financial obligations that the PPP isn't gonna cover. Um, and the idle loan is perfect for that because it allows you to cover you know, almost all business expenses. There are some limitations around refinancing debt and buying buildings and things like that, but you know, most folks aren't even aren't considering that right now given the fact that you know, they're focused on their core business. Um, so that's where the disaster loan and then the PPP can work together. Got it. That's very helpful. One point I want to ask a clarification on for the PPP, as you mentioned, it's really designed to, to keep your employees working and, and continue to pay, um, pay them through these, through these challenging times. But mm -hmm. I know that 75% is allocated for that, but can you use the money for more than two months worth of payroll? Is, can it be used beyond that? Can you explain that just a little bit? Sure. So it's set up right now to cover eight weeks. 
And what I would recommend to folks is um, when you when you complete the form and when you communicate with your lender, um, you know, as we've talked about, having the documentation available to the lender is incredibly important because when you go back to say, hey, this is what I intended to spend it on and this is what I actually spent it on, you know, assuming that those marry up. Uh, with the conversation you had with your lender, then, you know, obviously the forgivable piece of it comes into play. Um, so really knowing how you intend to spend it, uh, really having, you know, down to the dollar, the amount of money that you anticipate um, giving to your employees, you know, just based on the payroll, and then having your lender take a look through that, I think it's something that's really helpful. That way you and the lender are on the same page when it comes to time for forgivability. But to answer your question right now, it's just for eight weeks. Got it. Okay. And along those same lines, the calculation of the PPP loan forgiveness portion, it's been a little difficult to interpret. Will there be any final guidelines released by SBA or is it completely between the applicant and the lender? So there is information on the calculation um, on the website, I believe in the FAQs. Um, and after this call, I can certainly send you those links. Uh, even, I know my mother always says I talk too fast, and I probably spoke too fast when I was talking about the other websites, but I'll make sure that you have those websites as well as the link to the FAQs, because I think it's important that folks be able to look through those, because there was a new FAQ update that came out today, and they keep all of those in real time. Got it. Okay, that's very helpful. Um, and yes, we will. We are actually launching a, a site later to later this week that we're going to share with our uh, members at the at the end of this uh, call. One of the things that I, I wanted to make sure we clarified, and, and this was something that you mentioned on one of our previous calls, and that was to make sure that our, our members were taking advantage of their current lender relationships and to to try to access the funds and the loan process through their current bankers. However, when we did a survey of our of our minority business community, we found that over half of them did go to their lenders and still have not received any response. And now that there's going to be funds set aside through community banks, CDFIs, things of that nature, the question that we're hearing is, can, can people apply for a loan with more than one lender? And how, how does that work? So I, I think so the SBA district offices um, are, main, are speaking to the lenders in their communities to ensure that um, they have volume that can be uh, lent. So what I would go ahead and recommend is that if you're having issues with your, your lender from a timing perspective, contact the SBA district office because uh, I wanna make sure that you know, at a certain point, there's a loan number attached to these loans um, and that goes into a system. And I wouldn't want, you know, someone to be precluded um, because, you know, they go to another bank. Um, so having those conversations with the SBA district office and they can inform you of other banks that have available funds. Um, I don't know if they would be able to determine if they have a smaller queue, um, but then making sure that's all clear so that when you do, in fact, decide to apply, it's not going to kick you out of the system because they're you know, counting you twice and, and it appears that you've actually applied twice when you're really just seeking one loan. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. And I'm glad you said that because that has been a question I've heard from a number of, of our business owners is that they were intended to apply at a different, a number of different financial institutions simply because they were not getting any response from their, from their primary banking relationship. So that's, that's very helpful to, to and very helpful advice. Um, one other question I have for you, and then I'll let you wrap up because I know that, again, time is short. Um, we wanted to make sure that as we look at the next round of funding, that there's been specific monies allocated for minority, not minority business, but small businesses, community businesses, to ensure that we don't have the same type of scenario where the, the large amount of the funding is going to the larger, larger companies out there. Um, what can we expect from the, the allocation and what type of oversight will be provided to ensure that that process is actually followed this time? So, um, you know, the, the allocation, uh, assuming that the, it, it's passed in its, in its current form, um, is going to be to smaller lending 
institutions. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the Congress's rationale for that was that the smaller lending institutions, um, at which represents you know a lot of CDFIs and community banks, have those community relationships um, and are able to lend in their community. So that's the intention and the approach. Um, and you know the administration is from an from an oversight perspective. You know the SBA and I've had conversations with them internally. Um, are very focused on meeting that need. Um, I know that's an incredibly important priority to Administrator Carranza. Um, and so there's, there's real, real focus on that. Um, and in my new role with Opportunity Now, as I mentioned, I'm certainly making sure that underserved populations um, are, and, and other groups are aware of how to access this money. Um, and this is, you know, one of the reasons I've been very fortunate to be able to do so many webinars and, and you all have been so kind to host me is I really do like going through the step by step process because I feel as though you can never over communicate the process and I want to make sure that people are taking advantage um, of every opportunity that they can. And so I will just mention again, contacting your local SBA district office because although there are the federal programs out there, I know a lot of states and counties and cities are looking at ways to support, not to mention the technical assistance as well. Thank you so very much. Um, and Chris, I know that you are probably running on skates these days because this is a critical time for all of us. So I wanna thank you for coming on today, sharing just updates. Uh, we'll make sure that we get those links out to our, our audience so that they can have them. And we're making sure that we're pushing out your information as well. Just as we wrap as we wrap up, we know again, I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked the other two guests that were on. Everyone is anticipating though the hopefully it gets voted on and passed by the House today. The president signs it into law, the clock starts ticking. What should our members do to be ready so that they are not left behind at the end of the funding? process when this is actually released and what timing should they be looking at for that to, to be released to, to them to apply or to follow up because most of them are already in the queue. Sure. Uh, sure, I would reach out to your lenders and I'm going to make sure that I get you the links for all of those sites. Um, so, you know, look at them on a daily basis. There's great information there that you may not have already seen, um, but you'll get the most up-to-date information as well. Um, and then I would also reach out to the local SBA district office because uh, those folks, and I know firsthand experience, haven't been the acting administrator, they have their fingers on the pulse of what's happening in that community as well. And that's just, you know, very valuable information during these times. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Um, appreciate it. And thank you for being so gracious with uh, NMSDC and our, and our partnership. I really appreciate that. Um, you've been so willing to answer our questions, talk to our members. Um, most don't know that we have conversations that go on outside of just these, these webinars. So thank you so much for your willingness to, and to help us get the right information out to our, to our constituents. Um, oh, everyone, it's a pleasure. Thank you. No, no worries. And stay safe. Stay safe, Chris. Um, thank you all for joining us today. I know that we could probably keep this conversation going all day, but I know that you probably have other priorities. So we appreciate you taking the time to come on. We want to make sure that we're getting you valuable information so that you can continue to stay updated for your operations. Um, these town halls are designed for you. And we want to give a special thank you to the National Minority Business Enterprise Input Committee, the uh, national leader who is Clifford A. Bailey, for helping us to prepare the questions and making sure that your voices are being heard as we bring these guests on so that we can get information that is important to you and helps to address the issues and challenges that you have um, that's impacting your ability to keep your business operational. Hopefully many of you were able to see the video message that I sent out to you uh, earlier today. I think it's so important that we make sure that our voices are being heard, that we are getting in front of this legislation so that we don't find ourselves again on the sidelines and not, and not able to get access to uh, the funding for our, our minority businesses. So if you have the ability to use your platform to reach out to your, to your elected officials, please do so. We need to ensure 
that not just this money is a, a set aside for small businesses, but that the minority business community does have the opportunity to be able to have access to the funding. So we thank you so much again for joining us. We are really focusing on our future and how do we come through this ahead? ahead? How do we come through this together? And we wanna make sure that again, we are positioning all of our minority businesses to continue to meet the needs of our corporate supply chains. Um, we've, we've put in place processes to help connect you with each other. If you are a minority business that has been able to pivot your business to provide COVID-19 related products and services, please make sure you send us that information. And if you're a corporate member and you're still trying to access that information, please reach out to us. We wanna make sure that we continue to serve our mission of connecting minority businesses to corporate supply chain needs. We're asking you to also bookmark nmsdc.org. We wanna make sure that you have uh, access to the most recent and updated information. In the coming days, we will be launching our new website, which will be a link off of our main page, which is nmsdccares.org. That is where all of our COVID-19 related information will be. The links that you've heard today referenced by, by Chris Pilkerton, all of that information will be there. We're trying to create a one-stop resource for you so that you can go there and you'll understand not just what's going on with um, the funding and things of that nature, but also what's going on with our councils. They are doing some really innovative, great programming that they're delivering just as we are to make sure that they're serving their, their constituents on the ground as well. So we want to thank you, everybody, for joining us. Stay healthy, stay safe, stay connected, and remember, Minority Business Matters. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Oh, wait, one thing. Thank you to Minority Business News, our sponsor, who will be doing all of our editing for us as well. Thank you, Don McNeely and team. You guys do an awesome job, and we appreciate your partnership as well. Thanks, everybody. Stay healthy and stay safe.